He came shambling into judgment's round from the avenue of souls, a misshapen mass of flies. Seething lumps crawled on his body in mindless migration, black and glittering and occasionally falling away in frenzied clumps that exploded into fragmented flight as they struck the cobbles. The thirsting hour was coming to a close and the priest staggered in its wake, blind, deaf and silent. Honouring his god on this day, the servants of Hood, Lord of Death, had joined his companions in stripping naked and smearing himself in the blood of executed murderers. Blood that was stored in giant amphora lining the walls of the temple's nave. The brothers had then moved in procession out onto the streets of Unter to greet the god's sprites in joining the mortal dance that marked the season of Rot's last day. The guards lining the round parted to let the priest pass, then parted further for the spinning, buzzing cloud that trailed him. The sky over Unter was still more grey than blue, as the flies that had swept at dawn into the capital of the Mlazan Empire now rose, slowly winging out over the bay towards the salt marshes and the sunken islands beyond the reef. Pestilence came with the season of rot, and the season had come an unprecedented three times in the past ten years. The air of the round still buzzed, was still speckled as if filled with flying grit. Somewhere in the streets beyond, a dog yelped like a thing near death, but not near enough, and close to the round's central fountain, the abandoned mule that had collapsed earlier still kicked feebly in the air. Flies had crawled into the beast through every orifice and it was now bloated with gases. The animal, stubborn by its breed, was now over an hour in dying. As the priest staggered sightlessly past, flies rose from the mule in a swift curtain to join those already enshrouding him. It was clear to Fallison from where she and the others waited that the priest of Hood was striding directly towards her. His eyes were ten thousand eyes, but she was certain they were all fixed on her. Yet even this growing horror did little to stir the numbness that lay like a smothering blanket over her mind. She was aware of it rising inside, but the awareness seemed more a memory of fear than fear now alive within her. She barely recalled the first season of rot she'd lived through, but had clear memories of the second one. Just under three years ago, she had witnessed this day secure in the family estate, in the solid house with its windows shuttered and cloth sealed, with the braziers set outside the doors and on the courtyard's high, broken glass rimmed walls billowing the acrid smoke of Istral leaves. The last day of the season and its thirsting hour had been a time of remote revulsion for her, irritating and inconvenient, but nothing more. Then, she'd given little thought to the city's countless beggars and the stray animals bereft of shelter, or even to the poorer residents who were subsequently press-ganged into clean-up crews for days afterwards. The same city, but a different world. Fallison wondered if the guards would make any move towards the priest as he came closer to the Carl's victims. She and the others in the line were the charges of the Empress now, Lassine's responsibility, and the priest's path could be seen as blind and random, the imminent collision one of chance rather than design. Although, in her bones, Fallison knew differently. Would the helmed guards step forward, seek to guide the priest to one side, lead him safely through the round? I think not said the man squatting on her right. His half-closed eyes, buried deep in their sockets, flashed with something that might have been amusement. Seen you flicking your gaze. Guards to priest. Priest to guards. The big, silent man on her left slowly rose to his feet, pulling the chain with him. Fellison winced as the shackle yanked at her when the man folded his arms across his bare, scarred chest. He glared at the approaching priest, but said nothing. What does he want with me? Fellison asked in a whisper. 
What have I done to earn the priest of Hood's attention? The squatting man rocked back on his heels, tilting his face into the late afternoon sun. Queen of Dreams, is this self-centered youth I hear from those full, sweet lips? Or just the usual stance of noble blood around which the universe revolves? Answer me, I pray, fickle queen. Felicin scowled. I felt better when I thought you were asleep or dead. Dead men do not squat, lass. They sprawl. Hood's priest comes not for you, but for me. She faced him then, the chain rattling between them. He looked more of a sunken-eyed toad than a man. He was bald, his face webbed and tattooing, minute, black, square-etched symbols hidden within an overall pattern covering skin like a wrinkled scroll. He was naked but for a ragged loincloth, its dye a faded red. Flies crawled all over him, reluctant to leave, they danced on, but not, Felison realised, to Hood's bleak orchestration. The tattooed pattern covered the man, the boar's face overlying his own, the intricate maze of script-threaded, curled fur winding down his arms, covering his exposed thighs and shins, and the detailed hooves etched into the skin of his feet. Fallison had until now been too self-absorbed, too numb with shock to pay any attention to her companions in the chain line. This man was the priest of Fanar, the boar of summer, and the flies seemed to know it, understand it enough to alter their frenzied motion. She watched with morbid fascination as they gathered at the stumps at the ends of the man's wrists. The old scar tissue, the only place on him unclaimed by Fanna, but the paths the sprite took to those stumps touched not a single tattooed line. The flies danced a dance of avoidance, but for all that, they were eager to dance. The priest of Fanar had been ankle shackled last in the line. Everyone else had the narrow iron bands fastened around their wrists. His feet were wet with blood, and the flies hovered there, but did not land. She saw his eyes flick open as the sun's light was suddenly blocked. Hood's priest had arrived. Chain stirred as the man on Felicin's left drew back as far as the links allowed. The wall at her back felt hot. The tiles, painted with scenes of imperial pageantry, now slick through the thin weave of her slave tunic. Felicin stared at the fly-shrouded creature standing wordless before the squatting priest of Fanar. She could see no exposed flesh Nothing of the man himself. The flies had claimed all of him, and beneath them he lived in darkness where even the sun's heat could not touch him. The cloud around him spread out now, and Felicin shrank back as countless cold insect legs touched her legs, crawling swiftly up her thighs. She pulled her tunic's hem close around her, clamping her legs tight. The priest of Fanna spoke. His wide face split into a humorless grin. The first thing I was well past, Acolyte. Go back to your temple. Hood's servant made no reply, but seemed the buzzing changed pitch until the music of the wings vibrated in Fallison's bones. The priest's deep eyes narrowed and his tone shifted. Ah, well now. Indeed, I was once a servant of Fanner, but no longer, not for years. Fanner's touch cannot be scrubbed from my skin, yet it seems that while the boar of summer has no love for me, he has even less for you. Felicin felt something shiver in her soul as the buzzing rapidly shifted, forming words that she could understand. Secret. To show? Now? Go on then, the one-time servant of Fanner growled. Show me! 
Perhaps Fana acted then. The swatting hand of a furious god. Felicid would remember the moment and think on it often. For the secret was the mocking of immortals, a joke far beyond her understanding. But at that moment, the rising tide of horror within her broke free. The numbness of her soul seared away as the flies exploded outward, dispersing in all directions to reveal... No one. The former priest of Fana flinched as if struck, his eyes wide. From across the round, half a dozen guards cried out, wordless sounds punched from their throats. Chains snapped as others in the line jolted as if to flee. The iron loops set in the wall snatched taut, but the loops held, as did the chains. The guards rushed forward and the line shrank back into submission. Now that, the tattooed man shakily muttered, was uncalled for.